So I have a talk today with one slide and then a lot of me talking over my computer. So this is, how many ways can you skin a cat if the cat is a problem that needs an ML model to solve? And specifically what I'm gonna be talking about is our run inference framework and what you have to actually do to use it. It makes things easy, but there's some tricks, some small things you need to uh, have awareness of to make it work smoothly. And I love cats, but this is a common expression. There's more than one way to skin a cat. I don't know if any of them are right or wrong. Um, but so, we're talking about run inference and how it's instantiated. So I thought we should start with talking about run inference, the base class. This is where it lives and what it does and doesn't do. So run inference, you know, it's an interface that different framework specific models and model handlers implement. The main important things to know about run inference are that all of these model handlers, all of the run inference calls return a prediction result. So this is one thing that will catch you if you are not careful, is that especially when you're using um, what we'll get to in a second, pre-processing and processing functions on your model handler, what comes into the post-processing is always a prediction result. And the prediction result is a tuple what you almost always care about is the inference. So the, whatever you're uh, calling your, your item, usually it's a lambda, so it's x. So in your post-processing functions, you often want x dot inference. That's got the stuff you care about. So that's one thing to watch out for. Also here in run inference, we have our basic functions that the model handlers are going to implement. So the model handlers are all able to load a model and they're able to run inference. One thing that can trip you up is that there may be different expectations for some of these monitoring implementations in specific model handlers. And they'll get mad at you if you hand them the wrong thing. Uh, so some of them will expect a tensor and they'll count tensor bytes and some of them will expect a numpy array and they'll measure that. Uh, so that's something to be aware of. I'm skipping over things that don't usually uh, get in your way or that are easy to figure out. The environment variables is one that I actually added because it was very important when using GPUs, especially with TensorFlow, because TensorFlow is very greedy and it wants to eat up all the GPU memory. But you can pass environment variables to control its greed. Unfortunately, in Beam, you don't know how to necessarily set the environment variables before the model is loaded and eats all your memory. So this is something that we've made and it's in all the model handlers right now. You can actually pass that in at construction time as a, a named quarg. Very useful and very important. And I'll demonstrate how we use this in a couple of different models. The with preprocess function and with postprocess function. Uh, this lets you chain your pre and post processing to your model handler. It makes the code, I think, look more clean and more clear. The important thing to know is you can chain these together, but you want to do all the pre-processing, then all the post-processing. And of course, the inference is in between them, but that's not as obvious. So that's where that like post-processing expecting the prediction result becomes important. The pre-processing and post-processing functions are we do say we will execute them in the order you give them. So if you stack a bunch of pre-processing, it'll go in your code view top to bottom. 
and post-processing will also continue in that order top to bottom. Uh, let's see, there's some things to make it easy to share a model if you're in a multi-process context where you have shared resources. We also have the ability to have your keyed model handler because sometimes you want to make sure you hang on to the data that went into your inference uh, and that can be important. But I think these are the basic things like it's it's a big interface there's lots of stuff in there but these are the things that you most often have to be aware of or change when you're implementing an actual model to do something. So most of my talk today is going to be exactly that. I want to kind of using uh, image classification, walk you through what you actually have to do when you say, I have a model and I want to put it into my pipeline and run inference. So what I like to do here is for each one, we're going to start by looking at the model handler for this particular framework. Then we'll look at where I steal the code from, because like any good software engineer, I will happily cut and paste instead of write my own brilliant independent model for five different frameworks uh, in time for the conference. So here we're looking at the TensorFlow model handler. So when you have a TensorFlow model, that's the natural choice. And as we look at it, we see we have the pieces we expect. We have a defined function. What, when you call a run inference, what do you actually do? What call, what function are you calling on the model object? We have the ways to load the model, different ways to load the model. And we have all of our default properties. Those default properties are important because they are only the default. And this is another very common place to trip up. Um, most of these frameworks have multiple different calls you can make on a model, depending on your needs. And we can only make one of them the default for each model and data type. A very important part of any of these model handlers is looking at what you need to construct them because this will vary between models. My point before about the default inference function is made very obvious here because you can also pass in your own choice of inference function. And you'll often have to write a custom inference function to use some functionality that you need. Uh, so that's something to be well aware of. Uh, we try to keep the required uh, properties light. Most of the defaults will make sense, but this is one where the default has tripped me up numerous times and I do not wish that upon any of you. So that's kind of what we need to make a model handler for a TensorFlow model. So now I've decided I want to do something. I want to classify images and I mentioned that I'm lazy. So even better than cutting and pasting code, is pulling a model with helper functions from a model zoo. Uh, in this case, the TensorFlow Hub, the first thing we have a good model zoo for. So I look here and I say, this is what I'm trying to do. This is a, an image classification model. It's in the right format. I know what versions I need. I have a pretty good idea from looking here how they expect it to be used. This may not be how my model handler expects it to be used. So taking that, we get into the actual implementation of the pipeline with the model handler. Here we have to get our dependencies as normal. Then I'm going to say, I want to classify an image. So, of course, in a real pipeline, I would have some source, but here I'm lazy. I'm just going to pull in one image. This happens to be a bee. I 
normally would not do these transformations this early. I just want to show you the B so that you know if the model is right or wrong. And then we get into the true meat of the pipeline. I need to give to the model some accessory data. So in this case, many classifiers classify into a set number of categories. So I need to have the labels so that I can pull English back out when they say they're very confident that they've got number seven for this entity. The pre-processing and post-processing, I'm writing as functions. And there are two ways we could do this. I can write my own pre-processing function, which expects whatever's coming from the top of the pipeline. And I can write my own post-processing function, which as I mentioned before, always expects a prediction result. I could take each of these uh, transforms or maps and make them their own lambda and just write them in line. My personal preference is to group them together. Um, I think this makes it a little easier to read. I find when there's like a lot of the with statements, I can get confused about when pre-processing ends and post-processing begins. And this also makes it easier for me to uh, modify in one block something that may require several changes. So this is my personal preference, but both, both approaches work. Uh, so here we are, of course, opening our image, resizing, putting it into the correct format so that we end up with what the model expects. Uh, I recommend if you aren't sure what the model expects to also use the with exception handling and examine your dead letter queue to see if you've got things that are breaking in the pre-processing so you don't get the correct format or working correctly and your pre-processing has a bug, it's not feeding the model the correct format. Uh, this is another fairly frequent source of bugs is a mismatch between what you're actually giving the model and what it's been trained with. For the post-processing, as I said, we need to do the kind of a decoding. And as with a lot of these models, I not only get uh, results, but I get probabilities. And so here I'm going to trust the model and take the top probability and I'm not even going to look at what confidence it has. I'm going to say, I trust you, good old whichever model this is, mobile net. I'll take your first choice. But the nice thing is once I've got that, note the uh, post-processing, I do need to take that inference for my first step. Once I have those functions, the pipeline is surprisingly easy. I'm just creating my image, that's where my IO would be. Then I have the run inference call, that's the meat and potatoes of our inference pipeline. It takes the model handler that I've defined above where the model is loaded and then I just chain my pre-processing function and my post-processing function. Finally, I print out the results. And in fact, this model does predict that the B is a B. So this is one way, if you have a TensorFlow model, and I load it from the TensorFlow hub, the model handler is the same if you load it from saved weights, load it from a local saved model, all of that is just in that model handler constructor. Everything else would be the same. So this is a, probably the most succinct pipeline we have out of the ones I'm going to show you today. That model zoo helps a lot. And it's also helpful that the, the pre and post processing are relatively straightforward. Any questions about TensorFlow model handling? Mm -hmm. You'll see several similar things, so you can save your questions for the end if you would like, but I'm also happy to, to answer as you go along. Uh, there's nothing special. That would be in the model handler constructor. You can pass in a device parameter. 
And so there you would just say CPU or GPU. If you are in TensorFlow, the default is CPU, but it's very, you know, it's just like a named quarg and that's pretty well documented. But there's no, uh, we won't automatically detect that you would do better with a GPU. You do have to manually set that. So similar look at our PyTorch classifier. Oh, uh, sorry, I put Onyx ahead. Our Onyx model handler. Oh, another question. Yeah, sorry, I can't see anything due to the gloriously blinding lights. Yes, sir. This is also for batch processing. So when you have many images, so you are showing it just for one image, right? Ah, uh, it's... A B, but this, this is for... This could image work images. definitely in a streaming pipeline as well. Like all these, there's nothing about the functions Pre-processing, post-processing, all of that can work in a streaming pipeline just as well. Um, like it, if you're running a big model on a GPU in a streaming pipeline, it will be expensive. Right. Uh, that's usually more efficient to do in batch because you can saturate the GPU better. But as far as the mechanics of the pipeline, there's no, no bias towards batch or streaming. I'm just doing uh, single file examples because that's the easiest thing and I try to keep my demo relatively simple. Sure. Yeah, yeah. Okay, thank you. Does that make sense? Yes. Uh huh. Sure. Cool. So, next we're looking at our Onyx model handler. And Onyx is very interesting because it's trying to become the uh, interoperability standard or an abstraction that you can compile from other frameworks to. Uh, and some frameworks you can compile from Onyx into their framework. Onyx touts uh, efficiency gains in inference, and I haven't seen enough data to know if that, how efficient it is and how much you have to tune it. But a big advantage of the Onyx model handler is that that opens the door to many more frameworks that we don't have a specific model handler for. You don't have to write a custom model handler, if you can transform your model into an Onyx model. The Onyx model handler, Onyx is a, a little bit more of a heavyweight system, similar to our TensorRT model handler. But a nice thing about this is that you as the user don't have to interact with that heavyweight system in a very particular way. You can treat it pretty much like your other model handlers. Uh, we see with the constructor that we similarly have a designation for the model, what to use. We can say here whether we're going to be on GPU or CPU um, as a provider instead of as a device. We do have this large model flag, which is something that just kind of gives fair warning to the system you're loading on. Um, in Dataflow, for example, it can give you some extra time if you say I'm loading a 100 gigabyte model that may error out if you do not set this flag. But other than that, we see very similar functionality and very similar interface. We're still loading, running inference, and we still have our functions to gather metrics and allow chaining of pre and post processing functions. For Onyx, I'm stealing from this repository where they're implementing a different model, the Efficient Net Light 4, which is trying to be something you could use on a phone effectively. So I'm happy that this means I can run it on my Colab instance without having to set up my GPUs. Here again, I start with finding the model and then seeing how I would use the model if I were just writing my own Python classes because this tells me what I'm going to need to do to move it into the paradigm of our run inference. So here we see that again, it's fairly simple as far as what we need to do. We need to get a model and then run inference. However, this particular model has kind of an odd call that it's making for that inference. This is not the default 
Onyx model call. Instead, this is particular for this model and the data it expects. We also see that this is a heavier weight pre-processing because as always, your pre-processing has to be whatever was done when the model was trained to get good results. You could wish that they would also simply resize, but if you have a lot of transformations, that's a necessary cost of using that model and something you can weigh when you're choosing which model to use. So reading through here, I see my pre-processing steps, my inference steps, and it describes the output and then how I can render that. So I take that into my pipeline. We'll see that, again, I'm drawing down some data so that I can make my demo hopefully work. I have the pre-processing functions. The pre-processing functions are complex enough that I leave them in separate functions, though the top level function calls the functions underneath it. I can say that I need to define my own inference function for the first time in this demo. Because we saw an unusual signature, I have to implement the standard interface for the inference function. It's still going to return what the model expects. I'm still going to give an output that will become the inference part of that prediction result. Here, an advantage of this is that it also gives us the uh, ability to be, in a sense, more future-proof by having these custom inference functions. And it lets you use something as you find it instead of having to try to shoehorn it into a standard format that may not really fit the model that you're trying to use. The model handler, very easy to define. I have to give it for the inference function, the custom function I wrote. Pre-processing and post-processing, again, I chain with one function to pre-process and one to post-process. Post-process, I still do with the first reference to the result have to make sure I pay attention to the inference. And voila, I have here a bear. I have a more rich label set for this model, so I can say it's definitely an Ursus Arctos. So I'm confident that the model works well and that I've implemented it correctly. Any questions about Onyx? Yes. Hi, um, I just had a general question. So the input to run inference is a P collection, but it seems like the input into pre-process and pro-process is not a P collection. Why is that? The types are different. Ah, uh, well, the practically speaking, it is. It just kind of under the covers, you're, you're accessing it like you would in the process function in your do fun but you don't have to write all of the boilerplate. You just know you're getting an element mm. and then you can treat that element as a normal input to the function. Mm. So that's where I can write these easy lambdas. I know when I say lambda x, that x is the element output by the previous function. So I'm like under the covers, bits of p collection, but I don't have to treat it as a, an entire collection. I can treat it element by element, which is kind of the foundation of the beam model like I should only worry about one the one thing I have at a time uh, but does that make sense yeah that makes sense thanks cool thank you all right we have one more and then the one I couldn't get to work so this is going to be what I think is probably the most uh, frequently used pattern, and that this is a PyTorch model. We'll breeze through the PyTorch model handler. It's becoming old hat by now, I hope. You're all well versed in what a model handler looks like. We see our normal functions. Here PyTorch can accept either tensor or keyed tensor as inputs, so we have those separated. 
we have our normal loading and you can be glad that you don't have to write all of this yourself. Same thing to here if we're going to move it onto a device. We have to make sure we of course send the data to the device as well as the model to the device. Our default functions for inference and our model handler proper. Familiar things that we need to have a way to find the model in the state dict here, the model class so that we can know what we're calling, device if we want to specify CPU or GPU, inference functions, paths, some parameters for the models. Pretty straightforward. For PyTorch, why I like find I use the PyTorch model handler more than any other, is the wonderful hugging face transformers and other functions, other models that they give us access to. And there are auto functions that allow us to configure and pre-process very, very easily. So this is kind of my first stop when I have a problem I want to solve. It's like, can I solve it with a model from hugging face? Um, they just give you a, a lot of power for not a lot of work. Um, a nice thing about these transformer models is that they will be, by default, the PyTorch model. You can always use this with a PyTorch model handler, just passing in the uh, URI that identifies the model, and it will work very, very smoothly and easily. You can also get a, a TensorFlow model or often a Flax JAX model out of these, but I found PyTorch is uh, definitely the most tightly integrated with us. The documentation is extensive, but basically this is another model that's going to do image classification. And I can read through here to find out all of the things I need to know about configuration, how to prepare my data, and how to actually execute the inference. Writing in the pipeline, again, being able to pull that whole model, have all the configuration done for you, makes it very smooth and easy. I just need to know the string that uniquely identifies that model on Hugging Face. I have to import their transformers package, the classes that I'm using, and also their auto classes. Uh, for some of their auto classes, you don't even need the specific class for a model. You can just do the sequence to sequence model or one of their other classes that just needs the string to fully identify it. Again, I have my bear. I found I like the bear better than the bee. I got a processor and a model that are both instantiated from Hugging Face to be compatible with each other. I can then take the model that I have, make sure I have it available in a state that the transform expects. I have to write my custom inference function again because I need to be able to get the logits output. Logits pronunciation is not one of my strong suits. Um, this is not the standard output that we would get from our default inference function. But this is what I need because I'm going to then have to take the highest probability guess to get my output for correct classification. But something that you notice, I hope, is that when I've had to write these custom inference functions, it's not very onerous. Uh, often I can take what the model describes and plug it in very easily. Um, and then by doing that, it makes everything else downstream also continue to work smoothly. Model handler is instantiated with our parameters that we need here, including, of course, the config, also derived by that same string. We then have our very short post-processing function where I'll take the top item and then see what it, the label actually means. The pipeline itself is again short and sweet. I read my input, pre-process, post-process, inference happens in the middle, and we find that they agree that this is also a Bruin. I figure the addition of this is for 
improving people's vocabulary as they let models tell them what they're looking at. I have one more, but it'll be short because I couldn't get it to work. And I think that's also a useful thing to see. So XGBoost, we have XGBoost and uh, scikit-learn model handlers, but we don't have like a nice model zoo. We don't have a lot of downloadable GitHub trained XGBoost image classifiers. So you have to train that yourself. And that's where I was running uh, into some time pressure as my laptop became uncomfortably hot. But if I had a model that worked, it would follow the same pattern where I find a, in this case, a way to train the model for what I want to do, train it up, instantiate all of my necessary classes. You can see I'm having trouble with my dependencies. Pull the image I want to use. Set up my functions to do my post-processing. And then, again, write a fairly straightforward pipeline. I can just take my input, run my inference. Here, again, not my preference, but a good thing to see is that those pre-processing and post-processing functions do not need to be chained to your model handler. Of course, it's a pipeline, and you can just put the pre-processing functions as do funds ahead of it, and the post-processing as do funds behind it. Uh, that can be, I think, equal clarity. It's probably a little more code you have to write, but that may allow you to reuse code or transforms that you have written somewhere else. So either way will definitely work. You don't have to do all your pre-processing and post-processing in those with statements. So I knew when I was putting this talk together that if we'd done our job well, by the time you get to the third or fourth one, you will start to be bored. And that's great. It's not great for me as a speaker, but it means that we've achieved our goal of uniformity by learning one or two examples. If that lets you understand the pattern and the pattern is consistent, then that means you as a user are not bound by the cost of needing to learn one thing at the expense of another. So we really expect to continue this pattern for machine learning, for inference by adding whatever people want to use for inference next, expanding our model zoos to make the hugging face model handler as clean as the tensor hub, tensor flow hub model handler in general, trying to make it so that it does seem boring when you're moving, say, from a PyTorch model to a Flex model. And that's what would really make me feel I've succeeded and we've succeeded as a team is when doing a complex machine learning pipeline becomes an exercise in planning your business value, how you're going to use models to derive something from data you have, and not have to worry at all about how you're going to implement that in your pipeline. So that's the end of my talk. Floor is open for questions. Uh, the notebooks, I am I will release them all probably sometime. I'm about to go on vacation. Look for them in... Uh, early August. Uh, I'll make sure the XGBoost one works. But we have a lot of the patterns in our existing notebooks showing like we have at least one notebook for each um, model handler. I just wanted to show them all using a model that did the same thing. So there are good code examples of all of these in the repo now, but I'll also um, add these. Uh, the Beam repository, it's uh, examples, ML, examples, ML, period, examples, ML, inference. 
um, yeah, from the top level. It's not in the Python section where you might look.